All right, we're going to try to record this and, and uh, give you guys a playback option uh, if you need it later. All right, I'm looking at my official clock. There's Terry and Theron and Jim and Jeff, Heather, Jeanette, Becky, a couple unknowns, especially Theron. He's the ultimate unknown. Yes, there's the chat window. Good. Good on you, Becky. Uh, everybody, please locate the chat window. From time to time, I'm going to ask you for some feedback or uh, um, it just, you know, to kind of make sure that we're on the right page and, and uh, all communicating. Um, that chat window can be helpful for you. You can just pull it up. It can overlay or you can move it out of the way. Um, good morning, Heather. Heather's in Japan. Uh, William, what time is it uh, in Shanghai where you are? 8 a.m. Okay. 8 o'clock yeah. a.m. Yep. Morning time. Uh, okay. We're going to go ahead and get started, everybody. And um, I'm going to switch back into this. Uh, no, Jim, uh, you can get sound through either dial-in or there's a little, um, like, telephone-looking icon in your in your uh, conference control panel. If you click that, you'll also be able to um, access that. And bear with me just a moment while I uh, try to broadcast some video here for you as well. Okay, so let's see if this works. Go back to uh, slideshow mode. Okay, so let's just, uh, again, we're going to charge forward, and uh, I'm going to give you guys just kind of a, a real quick rundown, and we'll have people joining us, and if you drop out, just repop in. Um, first, I'm going to give you a, an update. Um, you may be able to see me here. I'm actually in my backup uh, location. Uh, my house, uh, the construction in the area has, has burned out the internet, uh, disconnected me. So I've been uh, struggling today. And uh, here I am uh, in my uh, other place in Bellevue trying to uh, make this thing happen. So hopefully technicalities and all that will go just fine. Um, all right. Uh, from time to time we do what we call Mentor Monday sessions. These are just uh, our way of kind of helping out fellow entrepreneurs and uh, touching on topics that seem to be interesting and in particular topics that seem to be recurring as a theme. So, for example, when I get, you know, questions in, in various forums or message groups or e even directly to me, I try to aggregate those subjects and, and come back to you guys uh, from time to time with content. I don't always have time, but when I do, I like to like to share. So, um, all right, so that's what we're doing here today. Um, and I want to just... For those who may not know me, I like to give you context. Um, my context is this is my 29th year owning my own business, so 29 years uh, running my own various companies of all different kinds, um, from service to retail, uh, including large retail rollouts and e-commerce, distribution, even manufacturing. Over that time, you know, uh, my consumer business has probably sold somewhere, well, well north now of $250 million uh, B to C and and the wholesale business is you know north of 500 million B to B, so you know three quarters of a billion dollars of transactions. I take no credit. It's all the people uh, who you know kind of put together the systems and the the companies. And even after that level of experience, I am very clear that I don't know nothing about nothing. And uh, so you know I'm the opposite of a guru. So you can take everything I say and throw it directly out the window if you wish. Uh, but I, I'm sharing you a piece of uh, information, perhaps a little bit of experience, and uh, it's up to you how you decide to approach it. Now, here's a guy who knows something about something. Uh, it's William. Say hello, William. Hi, everyone. Yeah, so William and I, we've, we've had the opportunity to work together now, oh, I don't know, it's probably very close to 10 years. And William uh, came out of Shanghai University a number of years ago and has uh, over 25 years of international trade. And in China, they call it foreign trade. But to us, since we're the foreigners, uh, we'll just think of it as international <laughs> trade. And uh, so not only uh, does William speak Mandarin and English, uh, a little trivia point is he also speaks Shanghainese. Right, William? Yeah. It is. And uh, it's very different and hard to understand if you're trying to listen for Mandarin. And finally, of course, he's a... He's a high-level negotiation and sourcing expert, 
of, of all kinds. Lots of experience. And William's going to kind of uh, pitch in uh, here, but I'm going to just try to cover some of these top seven mistakes that people make when they source from China. And we'll go through it kind of sequentially and maybe a little bit, um, you know, kind of beginning to end. Uh, but my objective, and I think our objective, William and I, is to make sure that you guys have the opportunity to uh, maybe skip a couple of the hard lessons learned. And, and maybe I'll even give you a story or two along the way. Uh, all right, so here we go. Okay, so the number one, um, and you could phrase this different ways, uh, but I think that the mistake that people make is they don't start with a desired result. In other words, they don't have the outcome that they want in mind, and fundamentally they don't think of all of the different um, parties that, that need to be involved. So, for example, it's clear enough that, that when you're uh, picking a product, and we're going to use Amazon selling businesses, the Amazon Cornerstone businesses are examples, but you're picking a product and you want it to sell, and that's about all of the thinking that you may do uh, in that context. And my mission is really to explain that there's a lot more to it. Um, so especially as you grow, you need to make sure that when you're doing the sourcing part, and maybe that's a merchandising function of your business, maybe you even have a merchandising department at some time, that you then talk to the marketing guys. Who's going to be responsible to do the marketing on this? Do you have a launch strategy? Uh, is anybody talking to finance? Can you actually afford to bring in a, a new product line? Um, hey, what about a warehouse or uh, operations people? Have they been communicated to so that they have the capacity or they have the understanding of the scheduling and, and when things are happening? Even though a lot of you guys, Amazon Cornerstone business, handle all these roles or all these functions yourselves, and I'm talking again about you know finance, operations, maybe even IT if you need to get uh, part of your data feeds or get it on your website, all of these functions are part of your business, even if you're a sole uh, runner of the entire operation. And so bear in mind that not understanding what each of those constituents, uh, for lack of a better term, need, uh, can be a really big a mistake. Uh, the other thing is, obviously, the consumer needs to be factored into this equation, right? The, the person actually buying the product. And I think a lot of times we don't do enough um, thinking about how can how can this idea or this product help the consumer and more thought needs to be given to how you can improve something that you may see um, you know I think just making lateral moves and just finding a product knocking it off and then by the way being mad and upset when other guys knock you off uh, it's overall it's um, it's not the, the best way to do business long term and it certainly um, won't create a long-term sustainable brand in my opinion so um, the, so we talked about the customer, we talked about the, the internal functions of your, of your company, but let's not forget the factory. The factory has you know, every bit as much uh, at stake here as you guys do, and if you are not communicating well with your factory, you don't consider the things that are uh, additive to them or uh, would hurt them, I think you, you really want to take a step back and, and make sure that whatever result you're intending is compatible and is acceptable to the, the factory. Um, we've had many cases where we would, uh, you know, um, kind of go down a road with a factory, and then only to find out some months later that there was some issue that we never contemplated or talked about or what have you, and that was a, a result of us not really planning uh, from, from the very beginning what our expected result was. So in my mind, this is a philosophical point, but if you don't start with the outcome in mind and then kind of engineer your way backwards, it's very, very difficult to predict what's going to happen. And so please take a minute when you're launching a product and don't just, you know, uh, glance over the stuff. Make, make a, a sales chart for the next, you know, four quarters um, or six months or however far you can think ahead. What's it going to sell? What's your margin contribution going to be? Um, what, do you, what do you expect the customer feedback to be like? What are some... Uh, weaknesses. Um, for those who have never heard of a SWOT al analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, that's usually a good process to consider running before you launch a new product. When you know the SWOT analysis of your product, you've contemplated how are the co what's the competition look like, uh, how, what's the factory you know going to think about this, uh, can marketing handle it, is the warehouse capable, does operations have capacity, can IT help us, whoever it is, and again. Even if you guys are still a one-man show, that's okay, but you are producing and uh, making all these functions come to life. 
in some cases you use uh, VAs and in other cases you're just doing it all but the point is it, it really is uh, highly relevant so we're going to charge for number one thing number one mistake to avoid is not planning the the desired result okay William and I could we could speak for a week about this topic alone don't you think William that miscommunication and a lack of understanding between parties is a big problem yeah this is a, it's a, it's a, it's a basic it is uh, basic yeah right and but don't you think that even at our experience level and I'm my 29th year in business I will more than 25 years we still have communication problems with factories don't you agree yeah <laughs> yeah it's almost this, impossible this, yeah this is what I'm saying to that if you if you expecting that to the, the 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 people of uh, the Chinese factory all reach the uh, the level you are expecting uh, probably from the European Europe, European companies or American companies the product price was different <laughs> what is that team yeah yeah so again the fundamental piece of this puzzle is you say something and you expect that the other person heard and understood what you said. Um, but I could tell you for a, a number of reasons, obviously language being the number one, whatever language you speak natively, they probably don't speak it natively unless it's you know Mandarin or Cantonese. And so you, you are already the deck stacked against you, right? Because without proper communication, it's difficult to um, kind of get perfect execution. And that's what we all want. We all want it to kind of just go along according to plan. But in addition to the language, there are vast cultural um, situations and the the, the cultural um, I don't know the, the cultural kind of climb that you have to make to learn and understand I think is a is a significant one and I want to encourage everybody to you know uh, kind of abide by the old saying when in Rome do as the Romans do right well when you're buying in China you really need to think and try to adapt your way of communicating to their way of understanding and uh, this is a big lesson I've learned over time um, so William would probably uh, again speak volumes about this if we gave him enough time. But the when, in China, if you ask a, a factory, if you know, can you do this for me? What's the answer they always tell us, uh, William? You you really see uh, before they uh, fully understanding what's your requirements, they just simply say yes. We can do <laughs> <laughs> that's right. So yeah. you, you literally can say almost anything, and the they get a plucky yes we can attitude, and uh, and that yes in China can mean yes we understand what you mean, uh, we have experience doing what you want to do, and we can execute with excellence, all the way through to uh, there's no way on God's good earth that we can ever do that, but we're still using the same word of yes, and so when you are interacting it's really important that you ask and this this includes people fluent in English do you understand what I mean and then you ask them to kind of repeat back to you does this make sense to you do you understand and then they can um, kind of repeat back what they heard and make sure that you're on the same page and William and I have sat around tables many times and the guy on this side of the table says a series of words and uh, you know commands or whatever they want and the guy on this side of the table says yep I agree I understand they even do a couple rounds, and and at some point, William and I will have to step in and go, all right, you're talking about this, and he's talking about that. Now, some of that's from experience, but a lot of it has to do with don't just assume that yes means yes. Um, and I can't be – I can't understate this fact more. Any of you guys can go out and do an Internet search on, you know, the, the China yes, uh, or even really – this is kind of a, an Asian phenomenon – that they don't want to disappoint you, they don't want to let you down, so they want to say yes. But that yes could cost you time, money, and a lot of headaches down the road. So be sure that you really are driving in exactly at what you want. Um, so that takes us to some of our next points. So how many of you guys, uh, I can't click out of this, but uh, you're welcome to uh, fill in the, uh, the little chat window there if you like. How many of you have a, an, a really uh, formalized PO system? where you actually, I'm going to take you through this uh, uh, thing here in a second, but versus how many of you guys are just using email and you're like, I will have a thousand items or 10,000 items times $5 um, equals, you know, whatever the total is. That's, that's mostly what I see in startups. That's how they make purchase orders. 
And when you have a purchase order process that is, uh, is not a process, I think you are at risk. So bear with me just a minute while I uh, switch something on my screen so I can see better. I see some feedback coming in. Uh, okay, Marvin's he's got audio. Yeah, of course, email, email from Heather and Jeff. Thanks, thanks for uh, popping in there. Uh, so let me just take you through just for a minute. Oh, I got to go back to there. Uh, formal POs. We'll use email to interact. Yeah, emails to go interact is good. Um, uh, all right, let me move that window out of my way so I can see this thing. All right, so just just to kind of take you, and by by no means is this a complete uh, process that a Fortune 500 guy would use, but this is a starter process for 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 guys like us. So um, consider this. Uh, you don't make a purchase order until you've already gone through the sourcing process, right? You've sourced it, you've gotten a sample, and you have kind of already gone through those systems, and and they're complete and they're kind of green lit. And so somebody says, all right, let's place an order. So you go ahead and you create a purchase order, and that should be done in a financial system, in my opinion. And I'm talking about, you know, it doesn't matter if you use QuickBooks or Zero or whatever. Um, Whatever financial system you have, you should make a purchase order in that system. And then, assuming you have a VA make that purchase order or somebody else, you should have an approval process. And I know it sounds crazy, but later when you look back, you, you're going to want to uh, see who's approving these and when they were approved and, and so on and so forth. So record keeping downstream is very important. And <laughs> I, I realize that, that scrappy entrepreneurs are like, I don't want bureaucracy, I don't want paperwork, I don't want hassles. But this can save you and, and uh, be an instrument for your success in the future. So you create a PO in the financial system. There's some approval process, and then you send that on to the supplier. The supplier gets the purchase order, and they read through it, and then they give you a PI or a pro forma invoice, and they'll send it to you, and you want to make sure that they match. And assuming they match, that's where you come around the corner there. Uh, if, if you're getting financing or terms from the supplier, then you book the payable and you kind of go through that process. Um, if not, then you got to make your deposit and kind of go through those things um, and you book your balance. All of this should be done in your financial system. Uh, I get guys every day asking me, well, not every day, but certainly every week, saying, hey, how can I manage my cash flow? It's hard to keep track of how many orders are coming in and when I got to pay for stuff. This is how. Um, based on, you know, when you first put in the PO and then if whether or not you're making a deposit, you're going to give an accounts payable date based on when that order needs to ship uh, to show you when your payable will be due. This will help you do cash flow forecasting. This is all a financial process. Um, of course, you, assuming we're following the, the financing lines, you, you make your deposit and then you do your financial accounting and then it pops down to where you actually will receive the PO. Now this is, again, the financial piece of the system, not the warehouse or operations piece. But even if you're sending it into Amazon, you need to have a receiving process, in theory, if, assuming you're managing your inventory, inside of your own financial books. This will help you kind of keep track of the ins and outs of inventory. Now, I know there's a lot of people, the pucker factor just went up really high. I, I, I can feel people resisting. Um, and it's okay if you can't do all of this right off the bat. It's okay if you're not tracking your inventory today in your own financial books. But over time, you're going to want to do this stuff. So I'm giving you kind of a picture of the future. Uh, again, uh, when you receive stuff, you need a variance process. It is very common for you know plus or minus units to be received. Maybe they're damaged. Uh, maybe they were short-shipped. But you need to have reason codes behind that when you receive it so that you can go communicate with the factory and resolve any variances that may exist, um, including when they overship it. Uh, you know, we've had cases where uh, that's happened, and we want to, you know, do the right thing and, and get it all sorted out. So, the point of this is, without a formalized purchasing process, and and I have seen massive companies, and I'm talking about, you know, 20 plus million in revenue, that were conducting their their purchasing by email, and they have no idea, really, their payables. They just kind of pay the bills as they come in, and I will tell you that vendors make mistakes all the time. You know, most of them are probably honest mistakes. But, you know, there's probably a few that are like, yeah, I wonder if I can get a little extra here. Don't let yourself fall victim to the financial stress of having mistakes. The purchase order, the payments, all of that stuff should line up and uh, make your life better long term. So that's the number three thing. Uh, let me just check my time here. I'm trying to go fast. 
All right, so at a minimum, you guys should try to move to from emails into using QuickBooks, and then make sure the the purchase uh, the pro forma invoice matches the purchase order, and over time consider adding inventory to your financial uh, your bookkeeping system, whatever that may be. Okay, boy, specifications. William, in your experience, how often do you think that specifications are the tiebreaker when we argue with a supplier about a, a problem on a shipment? Does that make sense? Uh, you mean the detailed specification of the product? Yeah, how helpful are they to suppliers? Uh, it's, I think it's not just uh, helpful to suppliers. It's uh, helpful to both uh, both parties. So I think that uh, uh, also just you mentioned uh, the, the PU, I think it's also important to uh, list all the uh, specifications, including packing and, uh, o and uh, any other OEM requirements. So uh, when they're making the, the factory making the PI, they understand it clearly and try to match the PO. And with the PO, PI return, you can understand how much the factory will understand the exact requirements. So the uh, specification is, uh, is, uh, is, is very important to uh, avoid the disputes in the future. When even uh, when the product is uh, in the mass production, there's a, if there's a dispute about specification, that would be a pro big problem for both parties. Yeah. So who will take care of the, uh, the, the, the cost? Who will be who are responsible for the, sh uh, the, 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 the cost? The waste and the cost. So that's very, very important. Yes, so William is exactly right, of course. And the fact is, your purchase order is not, and this is kind of a, a two-part spoiler alert here for you, but it's not just item times price and the extended uh, quantity. Uh, I really believe in uh, putting very detailed and specific specifications on your purchase order. And this this is essentially what forms your contract. This is saying, not only do I want, you know, whatever, a thousand silicone spatulas, but I want them to be made of this kind of silicone with these FDA standards, with this kind of lab testing, with this kind of material, um, whatever you can specify, materials, um, a gauge, density, thickness, um, gloss level we go to on some of our products, you definitely want to have all those written down into the PO. Um, we put, you know, uh, the the size of the cartons, the, the size of pallets, how the pallets should be packed, all kinds of stuff. Because otherwise, if you make assumptions, my philosophy is that's on you, the buyer. If you just assume the factory can read your mind about how you want a pallet or that they know... Uh, the standards of the U.S. or EU or wherever you're, in, excuse me, importing the product into. Uh, you, uh, that's your problem. It's it's your fault. And fundamentally, you know, it, prevention, right? What do they say? An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So without writing your specifications, you're taking a big, big risk later uh, and and having disputes. Now, I know there's a bunch of guys out there, and they're going, "Hey, I've never had a problem." Uh, I've done, you know, shipment after shipment, and I've never seen any problems. Uh, and I have a really good relationship with my supplier, blah, blah, blah. I could give you, uh, you know, kind of the, the standard response. And that's okay. Uh, so far, you've, you've been lucky. Um, and maybe you'll never have a problem, but I bet you will. Uh, and, you know, uh, Alex is also on here. He inspects containers every week. And virtually every week he finds some variance that is different than the specification and then that is a negotiation process to resolve that and we figure out what the next step is. Do we reject the shipment? Do we accept the shipment with a discount? What's the situation? But countless containers a month and you know it's it's not uncommon to have some slight variation uh, between those. So specifications that really is your secret weapon and if you guys take you know just a couple things away, well, you know, one is plant, well, you, I'll get you the list in the end, but don't forget specifications. And I'm not just saying, you know, make that flashlight out of aluminum. I'm saying at some point you need to get educated enough to say what alloy of aluminum, what's the number, what's the, the gauge, the density, um, to the extent there's a strength test that needs to be done, a flammability test for, for certain uh, products like textiles, um, I'm certainly not an expert in every category, but I would imagine that you know stuffed animals or toys or bedding, especially baby-related, probably have flammability tests. 
all of those types of tests, the exact ASTM standard and the exact results, minimum or maximum thresholds that you will accept, all of that is really, really important. And factories actually respect it and they love it and it shows them that you, you know, you're really sophisticated. Now, again, I know I've just increased the pucker factor and everybody's like, well, how do I know what specifications and I don't know what to put down. That's okay. Uh, it, it's okay. Don't worry about, um, you know, knowing every specification on your first thing. I, I believe it's an iterative process and over time you get better and better. And to be honest, usually when some mistake happens, we trace it back to the cause and then we figure out, oh, we need to write this in the PO so that we avoid this in the future. So it's okay for it to be an evolution for you. But no matter what product you're making, you should know the chemical composition, you should know density, weight, thicknesses, all that kind of stuff um, to avoid problems. And I'm going to give you a very quick story because I'm trying to stay very tight on time today. Uh, we, ha we had a, a situation where we were ordering, I don't know, 15 or 20 containers a month from this particular supplier. And, and every now and then on this one product line, and this one product was probably only three or four containers a month, but the color would be different and the 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 thickness would be slightly different and, and or, or the width or whatever is just just slightly different not so different that that we would go hey you, this is all wrong and this is uh, more than 10 years ago before we had a, a a good specification process and what we found is that um they they would just kind of make it based on how their equipment was set up at that time <laughs> and so once we resolved it by writing down the specifications on the um purchase order then they stay consistent with that. And, uh, and we'll talk more about that here in a minute. Okay, so charging forward. All right, so we're up to number five, five out of seven. All right, now it's really time for true confessions. I'm going to switch screen so I can see your responses. Any of you guys in the, the text window, tell me what percentage of your shipments, whether they're containers or air shipments or less than container load, how, what percentage of your shipments every month are you having inspected before they ship? Go ahead. Okay. All right. That's good. True confessions. Keep them coming. Nice. Okay. Very good, Aaron. It's okay, by the way, if it's zero. Uh, that just means, you know, you can solve that problem. Okay. 50-50 on a couple guys. I see a couple. Uh... All right. That's good. I mean, uh, listen. Uh, a, thanks for the feedback. Appreciate you playing along. And B, I think it's probably um, something that you could do the math on that it would be nice to to get things inspected. And I, I want to just share with you some of my experience on why inspections matter. Let's see if I can – oh, look at that. I'm going to just try to change something here. Bear with me just a moment. All right. Well, we'll just carry back to the, the main event. Okay, so um, – I'm going to just share just very quickly what my philosophy on inspections is, um, especially when you're beginning a product. But even downstream, I think that having part of your, your process involve physical inspection before it ships will save you a ton of money. Um, in the long run, it's inevitable you're going to have a problem. There's going to be some variation, some uh, mishap. Um, even if you specified it, maybe they missed it or forgot about it. And uh, one time, again, this is, you know, all the lessons I've learned, I've learned the hard way. <laughs> William, we even still learn lessons the hard way today, don't we? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but they're, they're all new lessons. We don't have to learn the same lesson twice. Um, and I won't take it into some of our pain points, uh, but I'll give you an old one that is just, uh, it illustrates my point. So, again, kind of like the variation I was talking to before, where the, the color or the size, something may be off just slightly. We just couldn't understand why some of these things were happening. And what we determined is from time to time, if the manufacturer was too busy or maybe they had a better opportunity financially, they would take our entire container and subcontract it out to another factory down the street. William, that happens over in China pretty commonly, wouldn't you say? Yeah, yeah. And by the way, they don't necessarily tell you they're doing that. They just are doing their, their kind of unit economics and their production schedule, and they're like, you know what? We either um, you know, don't have time or we can make more money if we just sub it out to these other guys, and they may not have the same kind of quality in the things that, that you think are important. 
these are um, <laughs> unwelcome surprises. Let's just put it like that. And Alex is on here, and and uh, uh, Viola, she's probably on here too. We've seen these kind of situations uh, where you know factories just kind of say, hey, yeah, we'll just move this thing or take it. Now you can't prevent a hundred percent unless you have somebody physically on premises all the time watching production, and obviously that takes substantial volume. But you can take steps to kind of go to the factory and do some pre-inspections when necessary, looking for raw materials. Um, we had a, a factory that we would do business with, and we would have a very specific set of environmental um, kind of restraints so that we made sure that the product passed our standards, emission standards, and so on. And every time I go to the factory, they would show off their beautiful the production lines and everything's going great. And then I would be like, hey, show me the, show me the raw materials that are the brand that we specify and they would have to show you know sufficient quantity of that raw material versus things that after they're done with production you don't necessarily know what's inside the the chemical composition because a lot of these things when they come out they look the same even if they didn't use the, the proper raw materials and I'm talking about uh, you know when you're making certain products with uh, vinyl or uh, plastics if they say, hey, we're going to use recycled vinyl or plastic for you, initially you might say, hey, that's great, um, until you realize that recycled vinyl in China has absolutely heavy metal pollution in it, every single one. So recycling that and or buying recycled materials out of China, not the right answer. Do you agree with that, William? I'm going on <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, he agrees. Yeah, different concepts. Yeah. yeah, so this is a very important point that when you say recycled, you mean one thing, and when they say it, they mean something else. And that's okay, right? These cultural differences are okay. I never, I'm never about judgment. I'm all about learning how the other guy feels. And, and you know, as I said, when in Rome, doing as Romans do, I want to figure out how they are doing it so that I can get better and smarter and faster about their approach, not my own. So my recommendation for anybody who's not getting inspections is – you know, there are plenty of places uh, online that you can do this sort of thing. Um, get somebody to go in and take a look and, and come up with an inspection criteria. Are the boxes right? Are, are all the specifications? And by the way, we didn't touch on this in specifications, but I want to make sure I hammer this home. Even your packaging should have specifications. Mm -hmm. You know, the thickness of the cardboard, the, the length, width, the, the type of printing, because they're really, really inexpensive ways. And, and the label. Label. And the label, quite right, yeah. Every every little detail, uh, leave nothing to chance, make no assumptions. Um, I'll give you one other quick story, and I'm just checking my clock here. So this goes particularly to my philosophy about inspections. Uh, there's something called the broken window principle, broken window theory. I'm not sure what they call it, but um, the, the general gist, and you guys can uh, Google that or whatever, bing it, uh, the, the gist is, in a, in a neighborhood, and I think Rudy Giuliani is a big proponent of this, he noticed that when, a, when a, a big abandoned building would get one broken window, that sooner or later, or actually sooner, all the windows would be broken. That entire area would become a little crime area because nobody was checking on it. Nobody was kind of maintaining it. And it, it was kind of a, a, a self-serving cycle of you know, uh, bad stuff. And my opinion is when you put rigid specifications and very clear deadlines on purchase orders and all those things, and you have an inspection process, then manufacturers are much more inclined to just simply do the right thing, not cut any corners, because they know you're checking on them, right? And that goes with the broken window principle of if, if, if there's a problem, you've got to bring it up and you've got to resolve it. It doesn't mean you're mean about it. It doesn't mean you're unprofessional, but it does mean, hey, this was out of spec, and you can have a various number of ways to resolve that. Uh, we're going to take it this one time, but if it's out of spec again, we're going to reject it uh, because maybe it's not a, a critical element. Uh, or it's out of spec and it's enough to cause me problems, so I need a discount, or it's out of spec and I'm going to just simply reject the thing entirely. And I, I don't know if you – I remember one time, William, I think I had some production. This is, it goes back uh, a ways when you and Todd were kind of doing the thing. But I remember we sent you into – to inspect some shiny stuff and you like rejected like 28 containers you remember that yeah, yeah. It's, it was an old old, old uh, time but you know those, 
Gloss, gloss level, you mean? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So we ordered a product with a particular gloss level and a particular specifications. And then when William went in to check it, I'm not sure if they had the whole 28 or done, but they had multiple containers done, ready to ship. And William was in there to do, you know, enforce the broken window principle. And honestly, he looked at it and he's like, this is, I can't ship this. I can't put my name on it. And that's what an inspector really should be doing is they put their name on it, uh, giving you that level of comfort. And I could tell you guys literally stories for, you know, days, um, maybe longer of, mistakes that people made uh, you know along the way whether it's uh, lack of inspection lack of specifications whatever it was and then they get the product and they have a large financial downside to that product it, it happens all the time and if it has to happen to you great kudos to you and thank your lucky stars but let's just get into prevention and then maybe you never have the problem and you don't have to worry about it all right so that's enough on that so this is this is a uh, big picture philosophy. Now, again, there's exceptions to every rule. I'm sure that you know a couple of you guys could go, "Hey, I found an item, and uh, three days later it was live on Amazon, sold a thousand units, whatever it was." But in general, I, I want everybody to kind of be patient a little bit because any kind of project, especially when you're launching a product, it will take longer and it will cost more. So, Alex, I don't have his audio on right now, but Alex is working with some new factories we have in Vietnam. And the first order's in, and although it hasn't cost more yet, um, there, there's opportunity costs that are not financial, but every one of our first shipments have been pushed back just a little ways, just a little bit, uh, you know, a week here, a couple weeks there. And that's not uncommon. And so I want people to kind of factor that into your process. If the factory says they have a 30-day, you know, lead time, go ahead and hold them to that time, but assume it'll be, you know, longer, add a couple weeks. Um, certainly, there's going to be time with you know customs that will come up. Uh, in particular, customs loves to hold shipments that are from new suppliers to new new buyers. So when they see those kind of new records, uh, you can get customs holds much more often than after it kind of gets going. So all of those things, it's going to take longer, uh, and it can cost more. Um, we've had situations where we've got a bunch of containers coming in, and customs says, "No, we're going to do a." Um, a full inspection. I don't remember what they call. Do you, uh, William, do you remember what U.S. Customs calls their their really extreme inspection process? The name. The, I don't know yeah. the name of the. Yeah, the I don't remember it. it. Yeah, do you remember the name? I. I it doesn't really matter. The, the fundamentally, when they say, "Hey, we're going to, um, you know, get into the full proctology exam on your container," that's going to take you time and it costs you money because all that time it sits in the storage yard and the transportation back and forth from the, the storage yard to customs and, and the time you have the container longer than you should, all of that gets billed to you. So congratulations. Um, you know, that's just part of the, part of the deal. So this is to give you a little bit of patience along the way. If you stress yourself out, and again, there's exceptions to every rule. Some things can go through perfectly fine the first time, although I've never seen that. Um, uh, in general, just remember, everything takes longer and costs more, in particular when it's a first order or product. Over time, it should get better, and it should get more predictable, and it should give you the chance of uh, forecasting a little more accurately. Okay, this is the last mistake, major mistake people make, and it happens all the time. So, uh, William, do you remember any of the reports that we had to produce for, like, lithium-ion batteries? The reports of... Uh, remember from U.S. Customs, sometimes I bring in... Um, when we bring in lithium-ion products, not only would we have to ship those differences, but we had to give U.S. Customs some reports. I don't remember the name. I don't know why I expect William to, but uh, don't worry about it, William. But fundamentally, when you're bringing in products, and this can include... Um, safety compliance, it can include duties and um, paying, you know, whatever the, the relevant duties. Uh, by the way, Terry talked about this uh, in one of the forums, but in some products there are countervailing duties and anti-dumping duties. Um, and so you really want to understand that this is part of that planning process uh, to avoid getting into an anti-dumping situation. Um, and we have products that have these situations and we're able to engineer the economics to still work, but there are many cases where it does not work. 
Now, what does this mean to you? How would this fall under lack of compliance? So let's just say for the sake of discussion that you say, hey, I've got this product and I want to bring it in and the factory says, uh, or maybe you've brought it in before, but the factory, you give the HTC code to them, that's the harmonized tariff code, that sets the amount of duty that you will pay. And let's just say that HTC code costs you 2%, um, or let's say 10%, it costs you 10%. The factory may come back and go, hey, we've got a different HTC, you know, it's 0%. And maybe it's a legitimate one and maybe it's not. Fundamentally, the responsibility falls on you. And a lot of you guys may not realize this, but when you import a container, um, Customs has an unlimited amount of time they can go retroactively and um, get, you know, duties, anti-dumping duties, countervailing duties back from you. So just imagine, you know, after... Two years, customs coming back going, oh, by the way, uh, you misclassed this item uh, or, you know, whatever the case may be, and you need to pay us extra money. And that, uh, again, talk about unwelcome surprises. That is a nightmare. Uh, other types of noncompliance. Uh, we talked about batteries briefly. Um, in Amazon and in other major warehouses like Home Depot and uh, Office Depot and Staples, all the big boys, they require something called works testing. W-E-R-K-E-S, W-E-R-K-S, yeah. And if you don't have the work certification, then you can't put it in their warehouse. And Amazon's starting to roll this in over time in multiple categories. That includes uh, certain liquids with certain chemicals, uh, not having an MSDS sheet when you uh, bring it into people's warehouse. All those compliance issues can really sneak up on you. And in extreme cases, they can be, um, you know, absolutely financially, uh, well, Disastrous. I know one guy, uh, t two years after he stopped importing this particular product, he got a $180,000 bill from customs because they said that the HTC he was using that got him basically 0% was improper for the products that he was bringing in, and they had samples from a couple of shipments along the way, and he should have been paying 8%. So that was a couple hundred thousand dollars that he had to pay and there's you, there's no getting out of it. There's no arguing with U.S. Customs. Now, you can argue and you can try to negotiate, and we have lawyers that help us with that, but that, that's not a fight you're going to win. So uh, avoid compliance problems uh, at all costs. So, again, when you start thinking about um, the types of things that warehouses need, the types of things customers need, um, it's really important that you think about this stuff up front. And even when you have to... <clears throat> when you have to pay a little bit of money for laboratory testing to ensure compliance. So let's imagine that you're doing an inspection process and there are some tools maybe an inspector can use to you know, measure gauge and depth and width and height and gloss and, and so on and so forth. But there are other cases that you might want to have third-party lab testing uh, run on a, a shipment from time to time. And this is a very um, important way to kind of avoid trouble downstream. So lack of compliance. So let's uh, let's just kind of go through this list. Now I rephrase these a little bit just to make sure that we get the point home to you. So if you don't plan ahead, right at the very beginning, what the, the desired outcome is, then you're not fully considering the results and needs of of everybody involved, and that includes the factory. Um, ineffective communication. We've talked about that. It's it's obvious, but I will tell you. In probably every conversation you're having with the factory right now, there's probably some small detail that has gone, you know, awry, forgotten, or ignored because they didn't fully understand. That's that's okay. You just got to slow down and make sure that every part of your um, requirements are, are outlined. Beware of the word yes, as we've talked about. Uh, go ahead and get your purchasing system farther along in the process. That's okay. It needs to happen over time. Don't worry about getting, you know, Fortune 500 level today. Um, not having specifications or improperly defining those specifications, um, all of that can work against you downstream. And and the, the pure absence of specifications in general is very, very difficult. Uh, without proper specs, a supplier can just switch the grade of material. Maybe you are getting, you know, thick textiles or, you know, thick metal, uh, you know, 8 millimeter, 2 millimeter, whatever the case may be, and without specifying it, they can just switch it if they think it will look the same and act the same. And almost never do the factories do this 
in a nefarious way, in a way to trying to hurt you, they're almost always doing it because you beat them down for price. Uh, in some cases, they're just trying to save some money themselves and, and um, you know, pocket a little extra profit. But in, if you beat them down on price and you haven't nailed down your specs, they're doing their engineering go, yeah, you know what, if we cut that material, you know, from four millimeter to two millimeter, yeah, we can get it that crazy price he wants. And they don't tell you that's what they're doing. They're just trying to say yes to you and get that price. So without those specs, you're, you're really in jeopardy. Um, inadequate supply chain inspection. So again, before it shifts, do your level best to have somebody put eyes on that thing. Over time, you'll get more sophisticated. you get better at it. I didn't have time today to show you some of the detailed reports that we have. Maybe I'll post some of those online later. But it's the, the amount of trouble and the amount of money you could save yourself by inspecting before it ships and, and engaging that problem immediately uh, before it ships. You have still power with the supplier. When it arrives here, especially if you've already paid for it 100% if you don't have terms, then my goodness, you really have almost not a leg to stand on. And that's, that's just the way it is in China. Is that fair to say, William, that once you've paid for it, it's kind of like, you know, they're, they're not going to give you your money back and they're, they might give you a few free items, but they're not going to do very much at all to help you. Uh, it's, uh, this, uh, I, I have to say that it's, it's, the situation is improving uh, because uh, the, uh, the exp with the, uh, the, the growing up, the experience working with the, uh, the, uh, uh, the international buyers, but yeah, I have to say some few, few some company factories is not so that honest or have the mentality of the custom service. So they just aim at one uh, one uh, transaction to try yeah. to keep them not lose the money, but they put the eye off for the future. Yes, but yeah, so it's it, improving. Yeah, I do agree with you. It is improving. Um, but for anybody in kind of the Western world, that's the EU, um, US, you know, uh, wherever you are that's kind of first world stuff, our vision of, you know, kind of customer service and taking care of the customer is very, very different than kind of the China way. Certainly five years ago, it's what I call the taillight warranty. When you can't see that truck anymore, your warranty's gone. Forget about it. But it is improving. Um, that said, if you can prevent a problem, Oh, why not do that? But yeah, yeah, you should be still careful. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> be careful. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, and of course, we already talked about the uh, the time and resources required are often underestimated. Give yourself a little bit of wiggle room. Um, even though we're all high performance, we all want to do more. Um, be realistic about the time, and then get better. Make it, you know, get better, smarter, faster. I got no issue with that. But be realistic so you don't find yourself, you know, kind of over pressing or over um, overreaching with a supplier, again, the supplier wants to say yes to you. So you tell them, they told you it would be six weeks, you told them it's got to be four weeks or you're not placing an order. They said yes. Well, guess what? I doubt that, you know, it's going to come out in four weeks. It's possible. There's always exceptions to the rule, but it's unlikely that you're really going to get what you want, certainly on a long-term basis. I almost, I almost never try to force, well, I never try to force a factory, but I will rarely have a factory change the way it does things to accommodate me. You want to work with the way they work with stuff as best you can. And finally, compliance. Guys, I know that you know a lot of you guys are still very emerging businesses, but uh, there are many cases. Um, I don't know how many of you guys have heard of lumber liquidators and formaldehyde, but this is a good example. They had a bunch of products, in this case it was flooring products, that were just full of formaldehyde. And Lumber liquidators had the right specs, they had the right everything, they just weren't doing the right testing and the right uh, compliance on that. And now their stock has been you know, absolutely hammered and they, they have all kinds of problems. The same in the, uh, I don't know, five, ten years ago with lead in, in toys and the paint that was used in toys. Even Disney had lead uh, in its paint on its toys and had to recall stuff. So that lack of compliance, and I would say again to William's point that it, that's getting better. The, the authorities in China and even the factories themselves are all trying to think longer term and, and big picture mm -hmm. stuff. But these are things that ultimately are your responsibility because your brand is on it and you're responsible to customers here. They couldn't care less about your factory. That's not their problem. Your, your customers only care about what you're going to do for them to take care of them. And, uh, you know, 
there's a lot of uh, lessons to be learned there. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and try to switch to some questions now. Uh, if you guys, uh, before I kind of introduce you to what Williams Project is all about, let me let me take a look. Uh, purchase orders. Uh, Aaron asks how detailed we get on purchase orders. I think we've talked about that. Extraordinarily detailed. Every every product, every color, every everything um, related to that product, we try to put it in the purchase order. Uh, Terry, I don't have any sourcing agents in Vietnam yet. Um, the stuff we're doing. Um, we either have relationships with some of the factories there already or through a third party, and we're sending uh, some of our uh, China team over to uh, do the inspections on that. So I don't have anybody in Vietnam. But just you know, go check Alibaba or check, uh, you know, search Vietnam sourcing agent. You'll find uh, some out there. And just like anything, interview and talk to them and make sure that uh, they kind of go with your philosophy and they can help you. Uh, let me see if I can switch into Q&A mode. I think that's a thing. Uh, Q&A. I don't know if that's going to unmute everybody. If it does, then. Okay, so if you guys ask a question, then it will uh, show the, the each each question, then I can click through them. Um, and again, we welcome questions on any topic that you may have, uh, especially related to China, because that's our uh, specialty. So it looks like Heather's first. Let's see what Heather's question is. I don't know if you typed it in. Heather, can you hear us? Oh, no audio. Okay, so uh, just type it in. Aaron's also in the queue. Yeah, if you just type it in, uh, for unless you have audio, um, I'll uh, wait for it. Anton, Aaron, if you guys want to type it in just to make sure that we... Uh, Kind of get to everybody, Becky. Yeah, no problem. All right, so um, yeah, so Alex, by the way, Alex is on our team, um, and he he's pointing out that Vietnam culture is very different than China, but a lot of China and Taiwanese owners are opening factories there. Um, so good point, Alex. Thank you for that. Uh, Heather asked for re um, for the inspection. Are you referring to 20% random inspection before shipping? Yes, uh, Heather. So uh, to just touch very quickly on a general inspection process. Instead, you can't go in and search and look at every single item. You're doing what is basically known as an audit. You grab some number, it could be 10% or 20%, that you test those items, you look at those items, make sure all the specs. You don't have to test every single item, but you, you look at those and look for variations. If you don't find any variations in that sample set, then the, the shipment's good to go and you send it on its way. If you, on the other hand, find a problem in that sample section, let's say you're starting with 10%, then you have to do another 10%. Uh, if you find more defects in that extra 10%, you got to do another 10%. And you may end up going through the entire 100% to find all the problems and then quantify the solution. But you start with a sample set. If, it's, if it checks out, you, you move on with your life. Um, if it doesn't check out, then you got to dive deeper until you really know the full um, scope of, of the issue. Uh, yeah, Terry's um, trying to go around anti-dumping duties. Yes, that absolutely is something you should do. Um, Aaron says, when a product fall, uh, fails inspection, they already have the deposit. Um, how do we best influence the supplier to fix a problem? So, so disputes happen. Um, <laughs> William, wouldn't you say disputes still happen in China? <laughs> Maybe he's uh, blocked out because of q and I'm not sure. Uh, so apologies, William, if I, I messed up your mic. Um, but w what I would suggest is that you, um, if, if the inspection says, yeah, this is absolutely not going to go and there's no fix for it, uh, in general, you can usually get the manufacturer to reproduce it according to the proper requirements and ship it, and you just suffer the delay. Um, a lot of times, guys in the U.S. or EU were like, hey, you failed, you're fired, give me my money back. And that's... That's rare that that's going to happen. Uh, they probably already spent the money, frankly. But often you, uh, depending on how customized your product is or how OEM'd up it is, sometimes you can get them to, you know, deal with that and, and dispose of that in some way. Sometimes they'll sell it in their own domestic market and then um, rerun the production. Uh, that's assuming that there's no specific fix that you can do um, for your product. 
Um, you know, in some cases the rivet's wrong, just re-rivet it or whatever it is. Um, if you guys have other questions, uh, go ahead and pop in. Um, what's the dish, um, shipping between ocean and air? So, so really this is primarily about sourcing and not the, the shipping or, or logistics, but I'll give you a quick answer on that, Anton, from my perspective. So number one, shipping, when you bring in something by um, ocean, you generally need to have a, a bond. Um, over time, you guys should get a continuous bond, and this makes sure that you can bring stuff in without having to run paperwork every single time and having a, whatever it is, $150 or $200 hit every time you take out a bond. Um, so that's one immediate difference with um, ocean. The second is um, that, uh, like, uh, but I think it's below $2,500, you, you don't have to do basically the, the normal custom stuff um, in terms of clearance, uh, UPS or DHL, they can just clear it all up easily for you. So that's the second thing that Ocean, if they're small shipments, has kind of an advantage on lighter paperwork and, and small shipments. But fundamentally, when they, they become bigger and bigger, you have to still abide by most of the rules. Um, Becky says, how do you deal with inspections across multiple suppliers in multiple locations? A very good question, Becky. And you, you just have to um, either get multiple uh, inspection um, you know, people or teams or companies or whatever, and you got to get in there. Um, and you know, we, we, uh, you know, Alex is always on the road. Sometimes William's on the road. Viola has gone on the road uh, a number of times. So this is just part of the process. If the supplier says they have certain specifications, um, how believable? Uh, not that believable, to be honest. Uh, I would always require third-party testing. And there are, there are labs that specialize in various categories. It depends on your product, but I would highly recommend that you just search your product and kind of lab tests, and you'll probably start getting a, an example and a, a set of tests that makes sense uh, to run. And even if, even if they give you their certification, they say, here's the start, just say, hey, no problem. Just go ahead and give me a third-party test before we place this order so I can make sure it works. Maybe you even agree to pay for that test. Uh, as a matter of good faith. Um, but if you proceed with the order, then they reimburse you or you split the cost or whatever. But, uh, you know, trust but verify. And I cannot stress this enough. That broken window principle, even though I glance over it, it is critical. Um, you have to have a sheriff on the job. Otherwise, crime will run rampant. That's, uh, that's my message. So I want to give you guys just one final uh, quick note here. Um, I, you're awesome there, too. Um, so William is now uh, running and, and leading a, an effort here in China. Actually, I'm not in China, but uh, if you need some of the sourcing stuff done for you, you know I don't beat you over the head with stuff we're selling, but just go to uh, www.mysimo.com, and you can look at the engagements that William and the team will be offering. Normally, we only do this for guys, and we don't even do it for very many guys. We only do it for guys we know, and they have to have massive volume, and I'm talking about you know, ten to twenty thousand dollar fixed contracts uh, for every month. That's just sourcing. That doesn't include the materials or shipping. That's just sourcing work. But we've broken it down into bite-sized chunks. We call them engagements. And you can get the bronze package or the silver package. Or hey, maybe you just need help with photos. We got a bunch of cool stuff. And I'm not the guy doing it. William's doing it, and the team, uh, Alex and Viola and others, they will execute with excellence. That those are great leaders and they're great people. Um, so take a look at it. Um, I think, you know, our mission is to try to empower entrepreneurs and give them access to stuff. And frankly, if we do it, uh, we take on an engagement and you hate it and don't like it, we'll just give you your money back. I don't care. Um, we just want happy people. We want to we want to get people um, operating better. Thanks, Viola, for putting that in. Okay, guys, it's 6 o'clock. Um, my battery's almost dead anyway, so it's time for me to go. Uh, if you have any final questions, I'll give you kind of the two-minute warning here. Uh, William, let me see if I can turn off the Q&A mode. Becky, I think we got to your question. If I didn't get to anybody's question, go ahead and say it. Uh, William, can you uh, tr test your mic, please? Yeah, I'm, I'm probably... Oh, there you are. Okay, I can hear you. Uh, do you have any uh, words of wisdom? You're welcome, Becky, Kara, sure. Any last words, uh, William? Uh, 
<laughs> no. Uh, yeah, thanks. You're welcome, everybody. Thank you guys for joining. I, you know, we all, we love entrepreneurs. You know, William and Viola and Alex and I, we've hosted entrepreneurs in China on these trips, and they're so fun. We have a great time, and we learn. So thank you all for joining us, and no doubt we'll see you online soon. Uh, thanks, everybody. Hey, oh, it's thanks nice to see you, Dana. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Good night. Bye.